నమస్కారం డాక్టర్ బిఆర్ అంబేద్కర్ సార్వత్రిక విశ్వవిద్యాలయం విద్యార్థిని విద్యార్థులకు స్వాగతం Today's program is on English a foundation course. In this course, which is a study skills course, we have a unit on using a dictionary. And today's program is specifically on using the dictionary as a language resource. Many of you must have used dictionaries in dif- on, di- on different occasions in your life, but I'm sure you will learn something from this program which you did not know before. Professor Tiku to speak to us today about the evolution of the dictionary. Could you tell us sir about uh, the beginnings of the dictionary? Uh, morning viewers, I think you know that the dictionary is about the richest source of knowledge on a language. The grammar and the dictionary between them give us the foundations of becoming knowledgeable about a language. Unfortunately, especially in the case of the dictionary, users are able to neither use it fully nor use it well. And this is particularly true of dictionaries that are very, very useful, comprehensive and full of useful information. And I am talking about the learner's dictionaries. Perhaps I should make this difference clear between a learner's dictionaries and other dictionaries. What I mean by the other dictionary is the native speaker's dictionary. A Telugu dictionary for Telugu speakers as opposed to a Telugu dictionary for learners of Telugu, let us say outside Andhra Pradesh. The English dictionary, the mother dictionary that we sometimes call it, is the new English dictionary. It is also called the Oxford English dictionary. It took about 80 years to put together. It is a dictionary which shows you the origin of words, the history of words, the development of words. It shows you how new meanings come into words, how old meanings are sometimes given up and also how new uses are added to words. But the dictionary we are talking about is for learners like you and us. We need the dictionary for different purposes and we also make demands on the dictionary which are different. We need the dictionary not for just the hard words as the native speaker needs. He needs to know words which have come from the Greek language, the Latin language or foreign borrowings and so on. We need the dictionary especially, particularly for words which are common but which have many meanings and many, many uses. The new dictionary which is called the advanced learners dictionary caters to these needs. Let me explain briefly how it happened. In the 1930s and 40s, there were a few people from England who came to Japan to teach English. They realized that the dictionary that had come from England either the mother dictionary or its babies like the chambers, like the concise Oxford did not cater to the Japanese learners needs. So, the first dictionary was put together in Tokyo in 1942. The same dictionary was reprinted and then renamed as the advanced learners dictionary by Oxford University Press in England and has become the first and the most sought after advanced learners dictionary. Now, there are half a dozen others which are equally good, maybe more than half a dozen. What do these dictionary do, dictionaries do that the mother dictionary or the other dictionary does not? The answer is 
that they cater to the needs of the foreign learner. They do it in two important ways. One, the most important thing, they not only help him to understand the meaning of a word, they also try to help him to use the word. So, they are not only comprehension dictionaries, but production dictionaries. Secondly, equally importantly perhaps, they tell him the things that they say, they explain in his her language, which means they use the means that are available to the learner to learn the language. These being the two main things, but they also over the years have taken on additional things, but let me briefly refer to them. First, every dictionary provides the pronunciation of a word, but whereas the native speaker dictionaries used to provide this information through spelling slightly differently. The advanced learners dictionaries, the new dictionaries provide you this information through a new alphabet, the international phonetic alphabet, which makes the pronunciation extremely clear. Secondly, they provide you definitions as I said earlier in the simplest possible way. Thirdly, and this is perhaps the most important thing, they provide you information on the grammar of the word, which was earlier on not available in dictionaries. In fact, it is growing as the days pass, as computer technology gives more and more help in doing all this, more and more grammatical information is becoming available from the learners dictionaries. Fourthly, they provide you information on the meaning potential of a word, by which we mean the multiple meanings of words. Almost every word, not all, but almost all the words in the language have more than one meaning. Some have half a dozen some have 20, 30, 50, 100 meanings, particularly a word like at or for and such small words, little words which you would have thought are very simple have as many as 100 or more meanings and this dictionary comes up with help on this. The new dictionaries also do something which again become clear about the companionship of words. An important thing to remember here is that a word like man is known by the company it keeps. You get to know a word only when you also know, in fact particularly know which words are habitually, usually its companions, which words go with it. Again, we will make it clear in our discussion. New dictionaries also provide you extremely useful information on what are called the style values of words. To explain this, I will take one more minute to tell you what that, what that, why that is necessary. When we speak a language or use a language, we speak it for different purposes, use it for different purposes. We also use it for talking to, writing to either the superior or the inferior or the equal, a younger person, an older person, equal person. In doing all this, we need to change from one type of language to another the formal language, the colloquial everyday language, the respectful language, right? the language in the playground as, a, as opposed to language in the law court, the language of speech as opposed to language of writing, all these are illustrated by small little items of information in the dictionary, sometimes only by one word like colloquial, slang, 
literary, archaic, pejorative and so on and so on. A dictionary now gives you a lot of information on the style values, on what word to use, where, when, with whom and in what context or for what purpose. That is another part of a dictionary. So, a new type of dictionary, the learner's dictionary is full of all these meanings, all these, all this type of information and unless and until you get to know how it provides each of these inf kinds of information, what the codes used are, some technical terms sometimes, some ways of expressing the meaning sometimes, you will not be able to grasp the full impact of a good learner's dictionary. Could you tell us, Professor Tiku, about uh, a little about the definitions uh, that you just mentioned? You talked about the codes that are used. Can you just uh, give a small illustration to uh, explain how definitions are used in dictionaries? Okay, I think a main purpose of every dictionary is to define the word. Because in order to know, for, for someone who does not know, what it means what the word means, the dictionary has to find different ways of defining it. For the very young child, the simplest definition would be, if it is possible, if it is a picturable noun, to give a picture and say, here it is. This is a leg, this is a table, this is a chair, this is a box and so on. But you cannot do this for all the words because not all the words are picturable and for some things you cannot even provide pictures of that kind in a book or you cannot bring them in the classroom if you are a teacher. So, you try to define it in the technical usual but so often difficult language. Okay. For example, in the dictionaries for the native speaker, the animal cat might be something like a quadruped, feline, etcetera, etcetera. But then you as non-native speakers, learners would not know what is being said. So, the new dictionaries will try as far as possible to define the words, each word in the language that is known to you. For some of these dictionaries which are now being used and recommended, all the words are defined within the first 2000 words of the English language. They are first because research done over many years on the basis of a lot of corpus gathered which means a lot of literature has been analyzed and they have found out that these 2000 words are the basics of the language. But they are also powerful because they are defining words. So, if you look up a dictionary like the Longman Contemporary Dic Dictionary or the Macmillan English Dictionary or the Advanced Learners Dictionary, each of them has their own defining vocabulary, some 2000, some 3000. So, what a dictionary therefore does is to try and make it easy for the intermediate level learner like you, the undergraduate get the meaning from the dictionary. Sometimes however, in spite of this easy explanation or definition, sometimes they do it in just three or four words as I said, um, a quadruped, feline, that sort of thing. Sometimes they give a full sentence as for example, in the case of carve, C A R V E, it is explained as to cut a large piece of cooked meat into smaller pieces using a knife. Now, here what is being done is that the word is explained through an explanation. So, you in defining you define the word by using three or four words which are its equivalents which put together its meaning or you explain it with the help of a full sentence an explanatory explanatory sentence. But what makes these learners dictionaries which are using very useful, very important for us is that they in addition provide examples of this. 
they will give you examples of for example if you are taking about carve they will tell you that you have a carving knife which does the carving at the dining table in some of the western homes right so they'll give you one or two examples typical very simple usually to make you see what exactly the word means here there's a little controversy which might help you because if you're using one type of dictionary as opposed to another say if you're using what's called co-built dictionary which has also become very popular it makes a claim that its examples are superior because they are all from the computer data they take these examples from the computer data which means computer has provided these natural examples and they provide these to the learner they say I don't believe it personally but they say that these are the only natural examples and that the native speaker teacher can't put together examples which are natural I don't believe it but they're useful in some ways because if you read them you'll see that these really happened but the other end the people who don't believe in it is teachers like us who make the example as simple and as clear for the user as possible so the new dictionary provides definitions in the simplest language but also it provides explanation but more importantly it provides examples of use sometimes two sometimes three which then make the learner understand the word for use not for just understanding but so that the learner can use it in his or her own composition thank you dr tiku for giving us the evolution of words of uh, for dictionary how the dictionary has evolved into the current form and also for telling us how the dictionary defines terms can we come back now to talk about uh, the grammar that uh, the grammar information that one can get from a dictionary professor tiku would you tell us please okay let's begin by looking at the word grammar itself grammar is rules of usage grammar is rules which are based on a lot of information you put together a lot of cases and say for example that the grammar of a Kashmiri I am a Kashmiri is that such people have long noses now that's a rule there will be exceptions but a rule is a rule and tells you about what the most of these things people animals have so in some ways you might say grammar is something that applies to a whole lot of things and the dictionary is a book which talks about individual words so how come we have a grammar of words but that's what the new learners dictionaries are able to give you what they are doing is to tell you what a grammar book does not do they tell you that in addition to what a grammar book does each word but certainly the important words of the language problem words of the language have other peculiarities which need attention let's take a few examples in this case <coughs> we all know that in English the noun becomes plural when we add an s or es to it we also know from school that some nouns don't take es or s right they either remain unchanged or they are changed in other ways like leave leaves or child children or no change at all dare dare sheep sheep but there is a particular variety or particular difference between nouns which the advanced learners dictionary spend a lot of time telling us and that is the difference between countable nouns and uncountable nouns and importantly those nouns which are both 
countable and uncountable. Countable nouns are the commonest, a book, a chair, a table, a wall, um, a corner, um, etc., etc. They can be counted. You can say one book, five books, ten books, two walls, ten walls, and so on and so on. Uncountable nouns have problematic um, usage because in our languages they are not always uncountable. Which means in our language, for example, we can say two newses and e w s. In Urdu or Hindi, we say do khabre, aaj ki khabre. In English, we cannot use plural with news. Similarly, we do not use plural with words like milk, water um, and so on, a number of liquids, oil. No, oil is ok perhaps many words. But there are nouns which can be both um, countable and in some cases also uncountable. We can for example, use waters when we refer to seas. And we can do this with words that are uncountable by putting other words as a cup of milk, cups of milk and so on and so on. Advanced learners dictionaries will give you a lot of rich information on countable uncountable words. Much more important than what they do with nouns is the English verb. The English verb as they say is a treacherous area. It has lots of problems, innumerable problems and the grammar of the word is a help. Let us take an example for this. Uh, in English we have transitive verbs, verbs that take objects. We have intransitive verbs, verbs that do not require objects. We have also what are called ditransitive verbs which means verbs which can go with two objects. I can say I walk, here is an intransitive verb, I run, I go, I come. I can also say I walk a mile, I walk my dog, he walked the old lady across the road. Okay, rather. Um, idiomatic use, but used. There are some words which take as I said which are ditransitive and take two objects. I say I gave him a book, I gave him indirect object a book in direct object. I can say I presented a bouquet to the speaker, two objects. But there are similar looking words or similar behavior, apparently behavior words like suggest or explain. Here comes the problem. They look like being the same as give and present and told and so on, but are not. You can say and you will find this in unit 3 explained, you can say I made a suggestion, I suggested something, I suggested an idea, I suggested they are doing something, I suggested that they do something, okay. but you cannot say I suggested them something. You are not allowed two objects with suggest and similarly you cannot say I explained them a proposition, you have to say I explained a proposition to the group. Okay. So, transitive, ditransitive and intransitive, but also exceptional words, verbs which have to be looked at with care. In your unit, you have several other examples. There is for example, the example given there is enjoy. Okay. We usually on most occasions do not say just enjoy, we say enjoy yourself, enjoy a meal, enjoy their company, enjoy reading this book. Although sometimes we will 
say, um, you've been asking for this book uh, for a long time. You're lucky. Here it is. Enjoy. This is particularly American, but now is being accepted all over the world. Okay. Similarly, you have an example in your unit L E A P, leap. Leap, as used there, is an intransitive verb. I give you an example of ditransitive verbs and the problems there. Here is an intransitive verb and the problem there. Intransitive verbs do not require objects. Okay? But some verbs which are intransitive use very often use with them adverbs uh, or particles. Leap is one of them. He leapt over the wall. Okay? But sometimes you might say, but very rarely you might say he leapt the wall and pursued the thief. Leaping the wall, he pursued the thief. So here is an intransitive verb which normally or generally on most occasions seeks an adverb or particle, but can be used without it sometimes. But then in any case you can use intransitive verbs usually most of them without an object. In fact, that is what you do. They do not take objects. Then you have examples in your unit of verbs which cannot be used in the passive forms. Okay? There is your word resemble again in your unit. Okay? You cannot say he was resembled by his mother or he was resembled his mother. Okay? You just use he resembled his father his father resembles him, that kind of thing. So, about the verbs of English, the dictionaries have particularly rich information. I am talking about these four or five dictionaries which, is called, which are called advanced learners or learners dictionaries. And it is important to be aware of the fact that these dictionaries give you information on the verb. Thank you, Dr. Tiku. మీ సందేహాలు సలహాలు సూచనలు పంపవలసిన చిన్నమా డైరెక్టర్ ఆడియో విజువల్ ప్రొడక్షన్ అండ్ రీసెర్చ్ సెంటర్ డాక్టర్ బిఆర్ అంబేద్కర్ ఓపెన్ యూనివర్సిటీ ప్రొఫెసర్ జి రామిరెడ్డి మార్క్ రోడ్ నెంబర్ 46 జూబ్లీ హిల్స్ హైదరాబాద్ 500033
Dr. Mukta Prahalad, who is a professor in the School of Distance Education at the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages. She has been a resource person for us and we have, um, she has been associated with this university at different levels in curriculum planning, in lesson preparation, in training for counsellors and so on. Welcome to the studios, Dr. Mukta. Can I now request uh, Dr. Mukta Prahalad to tell us about uh, pronunciation. As you all know, uh, a lot of us have problems with pronouncing a word. It is not just the meaning of the word that we look for today in the dictionary, but we get a doubt about how to pronounce the word. I would request Dr. Mukta Prahalad to please do, tell us what details one might get from a dictionary about pronunciation. What help can we get from a dictionary? I yeah, would like to begin by telling you about my own experience of learning a, a new language. When I come to a new language, I find it very difficult to get the pronunciation. And I often wondered how a dictionary which is all print can teach me sounds. Now, uh, today's dictionaries, two in particular, have CD-ROMs where you can get the sounds. But um, for the, those of us who do not have access to CD-ROMs, we can even use the print, uh, printed word to uh, get the, uh, the sounds from them. I have taken a few words as examples. Now, most of us find it very difficult. English is a language where the pronunciation does not depend on the spelling. Now, I have taken a few examples to show you how problem words can be pronounced better if we know the uh, pronunciation guide. Now, if you look at a dictionary, I am giving you one. Where does one get the sounds? They are always there either in the beginning or the end through a pronunciation guide. Now, you can look at them later, but what we can do is take some words. Now, take the list of words that I am showing you now. Now, they are all difficult. The first one is chauffeur. The second is pneumonia. The third is honest. Now, take the sixth word which is psychology. Now, you find that C H should normally be ch, but here it is sh. How do I know when C H is to be sh and when it is to be uh, ch? Now, if you look at the phonetic transcription given after the meaning of the word, you, uh, after the word itself, you will find the symbol sh. Now, if you are not familiar with the symbols, you can go back to the pronunciation guide and check them, but the, there is an indication of how to use it. Similarly, in English, we have silent letters as in the second word pneumonia. It begins with p, but the, the p in the spelling is not pronounced. Then you have h o n e s t, where the h is not pronounced and it is honest. Then you have a word like q u e u e, where the, it seems to have so many letters, but it is only pronounced q. Then you have q u a y, m a y would be may, but q u a y is key. And then you have another word like c h a r i s m a, which is pronounced charisma. Again, we will always need to refer to a dictionary when we need to check the pronunciation. I have given a few examples to illustrate. What else can we learn? Getting the sounds right is one thing. The next is getting the syllables right. In English, the stress that you put on the syllable affects its meaning and what part of speech it is used at as. If you look at another set of words that I have put up given, you have a word like psychiatrist. 
again the dictionary entry will break it up with hyphens in between. So, you have psychiatrist and the stressed syllable has a line above it. Similarly, magazine, then you have government, imagination, psychology. So, we would then we know that we should not say psychology, but psychology. Staying with the idea of stress, I would like to use a few more examples. You have a word like G R A D U A T E. When the word graduate is used as a noun, it is pronounced graduate, but when it is used as a verb, it is used as graduate. So, when I am using it as a verb and I pronounce it graduate, it is incorrect in spoken English. Similarly, a simple word like house, I live in a house, but I housed my guests okay. or guarantee. Now, there are this rule is not always the case. I have given guarantee as an example where the stress does not move, but you have express as a noun and express as a verb. This happens also in the case of some adjectives which are used as verbs. You have a word like separate which is which is a verb and separate which is the adjective. Now, information like this is something that most teachers might not give you, but you do not need to go to a teacher, you can rely on your dictionary. As I was saying earlier, spelling and pronunciation do not coincide in the case of English. Now, you have a dictionary like the active study dictionary, which I am familiar with, from which I have taken another example to illustrate this. You have what they call a spelling note for every entry, for every letter of the alphabet. I am showing you one for which comes under both C and K. Words with the sound k like cut may be spelt k like key or q u like queen. Now, the letter c in English can be pronounced both as sir and k. So, the entry is being made for sir also. Words with the sound sir like city may also be spelt with an s as in soon or P S as in psychology. Now, all this information is available where uh, regard with regard to pronunciation. Could you talk about collocation? We can tell the words by the company they keep it was what he said. Now, what we would like to uh, I mean I will give you an example like a word strong, strong and powerful are supposed to be uh, synonyms and therefore, should be able to be used interchangeably, but that does not happen. And so, you can talk of strong coffee, but not powerful coffee, but you can talk of strong antibiotics and powerful antibiotics. So, sometimes you can use them interchangeably and other times you cannot. Now, what most of us do is to use a word which is more neutral and overuse it. One such word is the word nice. So, you can say it is a nice person, a nice house, a nice book, a nice film, anything can be nice. Another such word is good. You can talk about a good film, a good book, a good meal, a good restaurant, anything again can be good. Now, I will give you a few examples to show of words that can be used instead of good. Now, again a good dictionary like the Macmillan's dictionary, which I think I had shown you earlier also. This is a new one, which I found particularly interesting, because it gives you information like this. What can you use instead of a simple word like good to increase your vocabulary? and to also have a little variety in the language you use. 
Now, here you have an entry for good which says that you can talk of a film which a good film like Kante can be called brilliant, it can be called excellent. Now, it also gives you information if you are talking to your friends, you can say that was a fantastic film, right. Now, that is also informal. Whereas, if you were talking about it in a book review, you would perhaps say it is an excellent film, you would not say it is a fab movie, right. Similarly, for food, you can say that cake you made was scrumptious or yummy if you were talking to your friend, but you would say it is a very, very delicious meal that you served me. Hmm? Then you go to see a play, you can say that it was a brilliant play or you can say Vivek Oberoi's acting was outstanding, right. So, then you talk of clothes, quality, the quality of clothes, these are good clothes or good machines. Now, good clothes would be uh, well made depending on what you are looking for when you are talking of their being good. Now, if they are very expensive and therefore good, you would say they are top of the range in the market. People, they are good people, are they kind, are they decent, are they respectable, for what reason are you calling them good? Again, uh, that is a brilliant idea or is it an interesting idea? You have a set of choices available to you through a dictionary. And this is one good way of increasing your vocabulary without actually studying it from any other book or waiting for your teacher to tell you. And that is why I find that a dictionary is one of my best friends. And I often uh, spend about 10 to 15 minutes a day just leafing through a dictionary, so that I can, uh, especially if it is a new edition, I can see what the changes are in the language which uh, perhaps the old uh, edition did not have. Now, that is what I like about dictionaries. They give you so much more than a teacher or a book, a textbook can, th because these keep changing and they also reflect current use that I find I, I can gain a lot about usage which I do not need to go and ask someone, because very often I do not meet anyone who speaks very good English. So, whom do I check with? Now, this may be the, a good way of handling problems. If you have a doubt, turn first to the dictionary, then to someone else. What sort of dictionary can we recommend for slow learners of English? I think here perhaps by slow learners, we mean learners who have not got enough stock of words. We are not talking about learners who are incapable of learning, but learners who for different reasons have not put together, have not got in their kitty a lot of words. Okay. So, I think some of these new dictionaries are providing a lot of information which even this not so proficient learner, learner with a very limited vocabulary can take advantage of. And this means information on the basic word stock of the language. Let us take an example. Um, the language has let us say uh, three, there are four or five like this, but let us take three words, speak, tell and ask. Now, the problem is the learner may not know, because he has very few words, that there is a difference between asking a question, telling someone something or s and saying something. Okay. We tell a story, we cannot say a story. Okay. We ask a question, we cannot tell a question. So, the dictionary will put these words together nowadays and try to explain to the learner that each word has its own range, although they look like being very 
synonymous, almost the same in meaning, they are not. Take another simple example. Uh, very often we find that even graduates of the language are saying, I purchased a pound of carrots okay? or I purchased a book for 17 rupees. Well, in the English language, the dictionary will tell you this is not done usually. You buy these small items and purchase is a big thing. You purchase a house, you purchase mansions, you purchase a large property. All right? So, That's it's a more a formal use, you'd say. Yes, purchase, purchase will be used um, on occasions where you are talking about big deals, purchasing, property. Um, say, uh, Microsoft. Uh, purchasing Infosys or the other way around, <laughs> that would be purchase. Or are you going for a large complex of buildings for your company? Let me go so back on what you just said about uh, ask, tell and uh, you know, uh, say. Uh, I think a lot of our learners experience difficulty with such common words as tell because they say I told to or I tell to, I will tell to you. Uh, how does the dictionary help? in such cases. You are saying that it is almost uh, cross-referencing which it makes, is that right? Yeah, I think there are two things here. One that each of these words will be separately tackled by the new dictionary. There is a huge entry on say and tell and almost the same on ask. But two, these dictionaries and that is the greatness of this kind of new attempt at dictionary making, they will bring them together and explain them in their mutual relationship of opposition, of synonymy and so on. But there is another point to remember in this case, those of the students who can afford it should think of the language activator, it is the long one language activator, but there are others. And uh, we have it here. Yeah, we have it here, language activator and it has got its um, babies which uh, Dr. Mukta Prahlad referred to, for example, active the acti activate, active study and so on, which are trying to put together, in fact have with some success put together what is called a thesaurus and a dictionary. A thesaurus differs from a dictionary in two things, in two ways. One, it is not arranged alphabetically. A, B, C, D, E, F, which are dictionaries. Every dictionary is an alphabetical arrangement of words. A thesaurus is not arranged like this. It is arranged in terms of concepts, ideas. A dictionary is arranged in terms of the letters of the alphabet and their arrangement. What the activator does it, it gives you the alphabetical order of words but it also from time to time, in fact quite often, takes words like tell and say and ask together and explains the similarities and differences. In fact, what these dictionaries now do is to give you a sometimes half a page, sometimes a full page account of a word of two or three words in their companionship in their relationship and gives you also choices of and I said this earlier which word is best used where, when and what will it do. For example, if you have words like thin, lean, um, sticky, slim. slim, which is the one you would use to show that someone does not have much flesh on his or her body, but is handsome looking, is ok. I think you would use slim rather than thin or lean or stick like. Okay? So, the dictionary will make you aware of these lesser known di differences between English words. And I think this is the answer to particularly to slow learners who have some vocabulary but have not learnt enough about even simple words because that is the strength of these dictionaries. They do not tackle historical evolution of words, they do not say what etymology says, they do not tell us about the literary value of words, they tell us about simple words in the simplest language and for the learner whose own language is limited. 
Could I go back to Dr. Mukta Prahlad and request her to say a little more about the entries on keep? Now, keep normally is a verb, but as I was saying, when you say he earns his keep by hel helping his elderly landlord, here it is a noun. Okay. Now, let us go back to the more usual use that is of keep as a verb. The patient is being kept under observation. What is the meaning of keep here and is it the same as I think we should keep this one and sell the others. Now, and compare it with the third sentence, keep these documents in a safe place. Are two and three the same? I think we should keep this one and sell the others. Keep in the second one is hold on to. whereas keep these documents in a safe place is to place them somewhere. Okay. Now, I think he will keep his word. Now, here it is being used idiomatically also to keep your word. You cannot say I, you can say I kept my word, I kept my promise, but not uh, I mean when you say I kept his book, it is something totally Quite different. different. <laughs> it means I did not return it. Right. So, the words that co-occur with keep will change the meaning and therefore, we have to be sensitive to this also. I think Pushpa yeah. I am through with that. Yeah. Thank you Mukta. Could we come back to what Professor Tiku said a short while ago about etymology and about what the old dictionary provided. I would like you to tell us also about how the dictionaries were prepared earlier and what we do today. I mean you did refer to it in your initial talk about the evolution of the dictionary when you mentioned the computerized data that is available today. But could you tell us a little about how the dictionary was prepared earlier? Okay, I think the best and simplest way would be to refer to the OED or NED, Oxford English Dictionary or ne New English Dictionary. As I said, it took 80 years first to a schoolmaster in Oxford called Lindley Murray to spend his lifetime and reach something like the letter L. And then other people who followed him for another 30 to 40 years to bring up or bring out this dictionary in 1928, something like 81 years or so after Murray had started on it. Now, this was because the dictionary is made by collecting on slips of paper, if you do not have the computer, information from all sources and English language has its sources everywhere. It is a borrower's language. It has taken words from every language. I was looking at um, uh, you know the word pandikoku in Telugu. It is an English word. Pandikoku, yes. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and so, every country has given words, every language has given words to English and these people collected for 80 long years words their histories, their build up, their nature, their changing uses, their new uses, their new meanings and so on. Today, and this is important for us, teams of workers use gigantic computers with their huge memories and collect data which means take passages and chapters and parts from books and take the, ask the computer to find out about the words meanings its companionship, its use, its new uses, its old uses and so on because words keep changing their meanings as I said and assuming new meanings. As Mukta was saying just now nice for example, at one time it meant silly and today nice is quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, that kind of way. Thank you Dr. Tiku for uh, giving us uh, a lot of extra information I think than what we find in our course material which is why I said that it is it's a privilege to have somebody like Professor Tiku here to tell us about the evolution of the dictionary, to tell us his own experience of uh, editing uh, volumes on the use of the dictionary and to have Dr. Mukta Prahlad here to tell us specifically about her experience of looking at different dictionaries and learning from them. As uh, we said right at the beginning it is a rich resource that we find uh, in the dictionary and it would be advisable for our learners not just to read the unit which tells them how to use the dictionary, but to get back to dictionaries and we have provided them dictionaries at study centers which they could perhaps look at if they do not have their own copies. The best thing of course, is to have your own copy of a dictionary and to refer to it as often as possible both for 
pronunciation and for uh, grammar, for resolving whatever doubts they have in grammar. I think uh, it has been a very uh, rich experience for me to have participated in this program with the resource persons who are here today. Thank you both of you for being here and for clarifying doubts for our learners and uh, telling us a lot about the use of the dictionary. As you can see, there are many different dictionaries which are available. We are not recommending one against the other. I think that is what we have said. We would rather that you look at your own purpose for the, uh, looking up a dictionary and your perhaps it is also important to consider how, how much you can afford to spend on a dictionary and then to use your own dictionary to go back to it as often as possible and use it as a language resource. Thank you once again. Ye wouldn't have a karakramalapai, me Sunday halu, salahalu, suit and loop pumpers na chidnama. Director Audio Visual Production and Research Center, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University, Professor G. Ramre D. Mark, Road No. 46, Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad 500033.